a sword with blood comes out of the body of a man lying in a mountain of corpses. The blue dialog box counts down and shows 36 minutes. A guy with short dark hair and red eyes looks at the bloody sword that he just pulled out of the man's body and thinks about the fact that he was already dead and that there are 35 minutes left. Then he reassures himself that he still has plenty of time. The blue dialog box shows 35 minutes and 57 seconds. Under a red sky and against a backdrop of rocks, the main character plunges a sword into another body among the corpses that cover the entire surface of the earth around him. He thinks that once the battle is over, he will wander through this place full of corpses to find the living. Then he goes on to say that it all started out the way it usually does in any fantasy novel. The main character is lying on a hospital bed, surrounded by monitors and IVs, and many medical devices are connected to his body. He goes on to say that this is a story about being reborn in a world full of swords and magic, different races and adventures. The main character, dressed in armor, stands with a sword at the ready and a sinister grin, surrounded by many different huge monsters with bloody mouths. He says that his first life in South Korea, full of injustice, ended in a painful death and the problem is that the world he now belongs to is very different from what is depicted in comics or novels. The blue dialog box shows 35 minutes and 49 seconds. The main character with a disgruntled face wipes his face covered with bandages with his hand and is amazed that he can't find a single survivor for several days. Then he notices a man who is white from blood loss, with a severed leg, and weapons sticking out of him. He is bleeding, says that he is in a lot of pain, and asks someone to help him. The main character, silently gritting his teeth, pierces him with a sword. The blue dialog box shows 20 hours, 58 minutes, and 32 seconds. The main character notes that it was an ordinary farmer. 20 hours. The main character is amazed, I think that it was not worth a whole day and this is not enough. Someone in armor approaches the main character, agreeing with him, and saying that recently there are fewer people close to death. He then asks the main character if it's because of him, stepping on the head of a bloodied corpse. He tells him that once you have tried to enjoy the search for fallen soldiers who are happy to have survived and happy to see their hopes dashed, you will not be able to avoid it. The main character turns to the person approaching him and with a tired face asks in his thoughts who it is. In front of him is a large, muscular man with purple hair, a protruding tongue, and an ear piercing, who asks him if he's new since he doesn't know him, and then introduces himself as Stefan, the soul collector. Why does he add, referring to the main character, that he just killed his toy, then opens his mouth wide with his tongue hanging out, swings his weapon and asks if he is ready to die. The main characters block his blow with their sword, and he is pushed back, and gritting his teeth, he is amazed at its power. Stefan quickly closes the distance and crosses swords with the main character, praising him for blocking his blow. Grinning with all his teeth, he draws attention to the fact that the main character looks good, so still young. The main character grits his teeth and continues to block his attack. Stefan asks him what rare toy he just found, and with a lick of his lips, adds that he's thrilled and can't wait to see the look on his face when he tears it apart and destroys it. Stefan does not have time to finish and to the surprise of the main character, something cuts in half. Stefan falls to the ground dead, and behind him stands a mustachioed man in armor with a bloody axe. Behind him is a plump man with a sword and a man with an eye patch. The man with the axe says he should have known Stefan was going to do something again. A plump man with a beard notes that this is brazen for a wanted criminal, to which the man with an eye patch says that it will not stop him, and he knows about it. A man with an axe asks the main character if he is alright, noting that he just almost got into a mess and should be grateful. The main characters grab their sword and start impaling Stefan's body, saying that they want him to die by his hand. The man with the axe and the man with the eye patch look at each other in disbelief. The man with the blindfold says that he would be angry too, to which the man with the axe replies that the main character does not look angry at first glance, but rather desperate. The main characters lean on their sword and try to catch their breath. The blue dialog box shows 127 hours, 15 minutes, and 43 seconds. Tired, he sits down on the ground and mentally rejoices that Stefan was still alive. He looks at Stefan's corpse and mentally disagrees with the idea that killing is fun, stating that he doesn't think so and asks not to be confused because he's not a monster obsessed with killing like him. He thinks that he has to do this only because of the timer that appeared after his reincarnation in this world. The blue timer shows 127 hours, 15 minutes and 8 seconds, the red one shows 8 seconds and the gray one shows 0 seconds. The main character concludes that as soon as the time that is visible only to him expires, he will die and there is only one way to increase it by taking the lives of others. The main character with a tired, painful face clutches at his heart and breathes heavily. He thinks about how even now, killing people makes his hands shake and his heart race, and he wonders in his head if he should live like this for the rest of his life. The man with the axe glanced at the protagonist and suggested that he join the mercenary group. 
The protagonist's eyes widened in surprise. The man with the blindfold asks him, addressing him as the captain, if he is sure, to which he replies that he stood up to Stefan, and he has potential. The mercenaries look at the main character sitting on the ground, and he asks if it will be easier to kill people if he becomes a mercenary. The captain tells him that he is asking strange things. Gloomy face of the main character. Chuckling, the captain says that there is no way to get used to it, and says that killing is not normal if you do not take into account the likes of that pervert, meaning Stefan. The protagonist, with a frustrated look, mentally agreed with the captain's words. The captain goes on and says that there is no need to get used to it, because in the end, the most important thing is your own life. The main character's mouth drops open in surprise. The captain asks him if that's why they all work as mercenaries, and tells him to keep getting stronger because not only humans, but all creatures do it, not because they want to, but to survive. The main character froze in amazement. The captain tells him to get up if he understands him. The main character slowly rises from the ground. A fat man with a beard smiles all over the main character's face, and a man with a blindfold says that although he is not happy, but this is the decision of the leader, so he will not object. The main character thinks that he does not want to live at the expense of other people's lives. The three mercenaries look at the main character standing in front of them, and the man with the blindfold asks what his name is, to which the main character replies that his name is Louis, but then corrects himself and asks to be called Louis. The main character thinks that he has no other choice but to live thanks to someone's death. Louis concludes in his thoughts that to survive, he must kill the others. Night. Over a two-story building in the windows of which the light is on, it's raining. An elderly man in a tavern says that he remembers the soul collector and that he couldn't forget even if he wanted to. He says that he met him in a territory battle about a month ago when he was a serf soldier under Viscount Bear. There is a sword fight on the battlefield and the ground is littered with corpses with swords inside. A bloodied Louis stands surrounded by soldiers, holding a sword covered in electricity with both hands. Continuing his story, the elderly man says that he wants to and obviously, but he was a knight and he heard that the power that does not use is different from magic. For a while, he tries to remember the correct word, and when he remembers, he says, the chosen ones who can use the ether. The main character's face is tense, blood streaks are visible under his eyes, and electric discharges are visible from below. He runs into a crowd of people with swords, swinging his sword, charged with electricity. The older man goes on to say that the very presence of a knight on the front line is a huge fear for soldiers, because ordinary wars can't even think about keeping up with the human movements that the ether uses. He strikes numerous fast and powerful blows with his sword at the soldiers surrounding him, from which they fly in different directions. An elderly man says that he cut ordinary soldiers like butter with his sword, but even so, they did not retreat, because they knew that they were not the only ones who should run. The main character raises a glowing electric sword over his head while the soldiers around him stand in a combat position. A hooded man blows a horn and the soldiers look back with hope on their faces. The main character turned around at the sound. Several burly men in shining armor appeared on the battlefield. The older man explains that they were accompanied by Viscount Bear's best knight squad, consisting of Lord Jackson and eight knights the Ashen Mist Knights. He added that they were the strongest warriors, the only ones who could kill this monster. The bald knight with the scarred eye smiled ominously as red energy enveloped his sword. The older man specifically mentioned Knight Nell, Knight Jackson's assistant, because they knew about his great achievements in the territorial wars and they had no doubt that the notorious soul collector would die on this battlefield. Knight Nell and Louis crossed swords and blue and red energy shot out in all directions. The main character looks intently at his opponent under the light of their swords. The older man adds that they then saw Nell's knight being cut in half. The main character cuts through the body of Knight Nell with his sword, smashing the enemy's sword to smithereens. The elderly man says that no one expected this and the battlefield was shrouded in silence. The knight's body fell to the ground behind the protagonist, raising his index finger up, the older man says that at that moment, he clearly heard what he said, I've saved up enough life. Lend me your strength, war god realm. Louis gritted his teeth, and his eyes lit up with a blue light. An elderly man says that something incredible happened, Viscount Bear and all his soldiers were defeated in less than 30 seconds. The dead knights are lying on the ground and the main character is standing, leaning on one knee, glowing red, and steam is coming from him. An elderly man says that after that they all ran away. But when they turned around, they saw that he was looking at them, all red because of the blood. The main character is sitting on the ground surrounded by corpses, leaning on his sword stuck in the ground. Louis wipes his face with his hand, his eyes glowing red. The older man says that his gaze seemed to say that this was not enough. The listener in the black cloak interrupts him and clarifies that all he did was call out the name of the god before the battle started and asked if there was anything else, giving the example that he might have eaten something. 
In response, the older man scratched his head and said that he wasn't sure. Under the listener's hood, you can see a mustache and goatee. He thanks him for the story and leaves him two gold coins. The older man is happy and thanks him, and then tells him that he didn't tell him the name of the mercenary. But the man in the black raincoat says that he already knows his name and that he has recently gained fame. He then added that he thinks he's celebrating with his allies. Three large mugs of beer hit each other, toasts are heard for the victory. Men drink beer and eat meat in the tavern, obscene language is distributed. At the back table of the tavern, Louis stares at the blue screen. The meter reads 1,000 hours, 42 minutes, and 32 seconds, and Louis thinks with a tense face that it's not enough, that he doesn't have enough life, because it's about a month and a half. Then he thinks it's better than living like Min Hayek, and adds that in his real world, he was destined to die in bed without being able to do anything. Louis is lying in a hospital bed, surrounded by monitors and IVs, and a variety of medical devices are connected to his body. Under the mask of the life support machine, Louis' face shows a desiccated lip. He recalls that he wanted to be born with a healthy body in his next life and said that God told him that he would fulfill his wish and brought him here, to this medieval fantasy world. He recalls the battle described earlier. He is indignant and asks if God has ever read other novels, wondering why he did not give him a special advantage, but gave him a time limit. The blue timer shows 1,000 hours, 52 minutes, and 1 second. Louis calculates that if a simple surf can give him a day to live, then to live for half a year, he needs to kill about 180 people, and given the time he spends sleeping and traveling, you can add 9 more to this number. He lets out a sigh and slams his mug down on the table, surprised that it doesn't mean he's the world's most vicious killer. Suddenly someone calls out to him, a hand. A plump mercenary with a beard and a full beer mug in his hand smiles and asks why he has such a scowl on his face. If he's already drunk. He says yes and says that he doesn't know when he can die, how long he can, holding Louis under his arm. A man with a blindfold, the vice captain approaches the table and says enjoy while he can. He adds with a smile that a sad best fighter would ruin the atmosphere here. The man at the next table demanded that Louis tell them how he killed those knights. The vice captain, with a serious face, says that he is also interested and asks Louis how he killed them. He added that scoundrels like them didn't usually show up at such battles, especially Nell, who had quickly reached the master level. Louis was upset that they brought it up again, and he smiled and said that he was just lucky that the rumors were exaggerating their abilities, thinking that they wouldn't believe him even if he told them the truth. The vice president told him they weren't stupid, and four of them were killed by Nell. Hearing this, the men in the tavern closed their eyes and lowered their heads slightly. The vice president added that he was definitely not someone who could be defeated by mere luck, and asked Louis what he was hiding from them with a serious face. Louis looked back at him with a serious face, and then grinned, raised his hands, and said that he was joking, and now he will tell them everything, ask them to listen carefully. He clasped his hands in front of him, his face darkened abruptly, and said that he had risked all the life he had. The people in the tavern opened their mouths in surprise and then shouted that they were all fighting at the risk of their lives and started throwing beer mugs at the grinning Louis, asking do you have a few lives or what? A mercenary captain stepped forward and asked them to leave him because nothing would change whether they found out or not. Then he turned to Louis with a smile and asked if he could steal it for a second. Captain of the Crusher squad turned. Louis agreed and got up from the table. The vice president told him to try to get back before they finished all their beer. Annoyed, Louis asks him where his love for an ally has gone, to which the vice president replies with a grin that he didn't have one. Louis walks out the door. The vice president's face changes abruptly, turns to the full mercenary, tells him to stop drinking, and gives the command to collect the kids from the night squad. The latter asks him why, to which he replies that they should work and adds with a serious face that he is a little worried. Louis walks into the captain's room and asks why he was called. Thern bursts out laughing and praises Louis for doing a great job, adding that he didn't know a rookie would be so awesome, but he thinks he saw something in him back then. He grabs Louis' arm, pulls out a chair, and calls for a drink, to which Louis objects and says he can go on his own. Thern asks him if he remembers the first time he came. Louis sits down at the table, interrupts him and asks him to get down to business, adding that he has never turned down a job. Louis smiled a little. Tyen replied that they should celebrate first and then get down to business by pouring beer into a glass. He smiles and says that he thinks they can do at least that much. He sets the glass down on the table in front of Louis and tells him that they got it recently and it's pretty good. Louis thanks him and starts drinking, and Thern smiles good-naturedly. He then thanks Louis for what he did and informs him that Burr has actually given up on this fight, but that doesn't mean he's officially done with it. Tyen's face became extremely serious. He continued by saying that it's usually right to end the battle when Burr pays the compensation, but recently he said that he wants to meet their customer. Louis replied that it was like he wanted to take another round before giving up, and Thorne held up his hand, palm up, and said that he was pretty sure he didn't want to pay the mercenaries and soldiers he hired, so he probably planned to kill them all. 
pointing his finger at Louis, he said that he knew it was a terrible thing to do, but clarified that it was something that nobles always do and said that he wanted Louis to accompany Viscount Bear as a secret mission. Louis argued that if he only needed help and an escort, it didn't have to be him. Opening his desk drawer, Thern replied that it was for his honor's sake and that he thought his fame was enough to keep him proud even if he was caught wandering around. He handed Louis a small scroll and said it was the address of the meeting place. He told him afterward that he was sure it was worthless for him, but that he would give him a decent reward and that he could take his time. Before he could finish, Louis opened the door and said he'd go now, but Nash would think about it later, and smiled as he turned his head back to turn. Then he added that the vice captain was probably looking for him. Kyan smiled broadly, agreed, and told him to take care of himself. Walking through the forest at night, Louis thinks about how he's fighting on the battlefield to get through another day, but the aristocrats are sending people to fight to save some money. Cautiously looking around, he thought that it had been more than ten years since he came to this world, but he was still not used to treating people's lives casually. Then he added that it was none of his business. Louis saw a human figure behind a tree and asked if it was Viscount Bear. Then he noticed that human figures were also coming out from behind, and he realized that it was a trap. He said that he had bad memories while the cloaked men were surrounding him. Looking at their clothes, he assumed they were the Knights of Burr and asked if they were gathered here to avenge their dead allies. Louis said that he was fine with it, because the Knights give him more time than normal people and took out the sword from the scabbard on his back. As soon as he started using the ether, his mouth bled profusely and he fell on all fours on the ground. Gritting his teeth, he realized that his drink had been poisoned. They swung their swords at him, and he swung back, but they were faster, and the two of them plunged their swords into his body. Louis was thinking that if there was poison in the drinks, then not only he was in danger, but also his allies. Blood spurted from Louis' mouth. The two men took their blades out of Louis' body and he fell to the ground. The hooded man said that even if he is a great soul collector, he is not immune to the ether neutralizing poison. That hooded man turned out to be the vice president, and he added that he was glad he was worth it. Louis also saw among his opponents a plump mercenary from his squad. The man begged him not to blame them too much and said they weren't doing it because they wanted to. While bleeding and trying to get up, Louis asked them if Viscount Lee paid them to kill him and got money for his head, he asked if that was why they poisoned his drink. He started to say, if Captain Tyan finds out you did this. The hooded man interrupted him and said that he was a little embarrassed to say this, but the person who poisoned him planned it and ordered it was all Captain Turn. Thorn pours the contents of his glass onto the ground with a sinister grin. Louis mouth drops open in surprise and he doesn't understand why he did it. If they were allies and memories of the time he spent among these mercenaries fly before his eyes. Realizing what was happening, Louis smiled wickedly and said that he was the only one who thought so. He cursed the fantasy world in his mind once more until one of his opponents raised his sword over it. He caught the blade in his hand and said, System, I'll pay 1,000 hours. The blue timer shows 1.000 hours and 27 seconds. The blue dialog box says, Automatic purchase, only one option is available. Blessing of round 1.000. The timer turns red and the numbers on it start to drop rapidly. The vice president sees the blue ether energy coming from Louis' hands and doesn't understand what's going on or where he got this power from. The red timer shows 715 hours, 34 minutes, and six seconds. He shouts and says that he shouldn't be able to use ether. The blue dialog box says, Blessing of round one, battlefield power, reduces your pain. The red timer shows 418 hours, six minutes, and 23 seconds. Louis reminded the vice president that he had recently asked him how he defeated the Knights of Burr. The blue dialog box says, Blessing of round two, ready for battle, 10x strength, 5x stamina. The vice president looks at Louis in horror. Louis tells him that he must have thought he was fooling around, but he told him the truth. The blue dialogue box says, Blessing of round 3, attack execution, accelerated healing of wounds, does not heal completely. The wounds on Louis' body glow red and start to heal. The blue dialogue box says, Blessing of round 4, Blessing of the God of War, all ether is replaced with the divine power of the God of War. The red timer shows 16 seconds. Louis' eyes glow red, he smiles ominously, a bright red energy radiates from him, and he breaks the opponent's blade with his hand, shouting that he is risking his life. The red dialog box says, Warning, you have 15 seconds left to live. He smiles, one of his eyes glowing red. Men in armor are standing around Louis, and a man with a beard is shouting orders to attack the entire place and says that Louis doesn't even have a weapon, to which Louis gives a sinister grin and asks if he's sure. Louis is standing in a certain red space strewn with human skulls, huge swords sticking out of piles of them. A blue dialogue box indicates that he has entered the God of War field, and as long as Realm's blessing is activated, Louis can use the weapon. Louis walks over to one of the swords stuck in the ground and holds out his hand. A blue dialogue box announces that he has chosen Realm's battle dagger and its price is 4 lives per second. 
The red timer shows 9 seconds, then 8 seconds. Louis swings his huge sword, which glows red. The red timer shows 5 seconds. The vice president, with a shocked expression, asks what this incredible sword is and how it was able to do it. Louis, moving at an inhumanly fast speed through the crowd of enemies, strikes them with his sword, leaving a red trail. The red timer shows 4 seconds. Slipping on the momentum of the fast movement, Louis stops, one glowing red foot outstretched in front of him. The red timer shows 1 second. The dust clears in front of Louis' face, red energy lighting up the back of his face, his eyes hidden under his bangs. He asks them to ask one thing, what kind of person he was to them. The vice president grins as blood spurts from the sword wound that runs all over his face, making him ask emotional questions. He asks if he expected them to become one family. Blood gushes out from numerous wounds on the bodies of the armored men standing behind Louis, who holds his huge sword behind him and glows with red energy. The blue timer shows 507 hours, 57 minutes, and 6 seconds. The blade disappears from Louis' hand. A blue dialogue box announces the restoration of Realm's battle dagger, the deactivation of Realm's blessing, and that physical overload temporarily limits Louis' abilities. Blood spurts from Louis' mouth and he clears his throat. Crouching on one knee as the red energy dissipated around his body, he cursed the war god buff and said that it had helped him enough and he wouldn't die. With a grim look, he wonders if all of Thern's mercenaries have betrayed him, and comes to the conclusion that it's impossible because they've been allies for a very long time and at least one of them should be on his side. The blue timer shows 507 hours, 56 minutes, and 23 seconds. Louis leaves the battlefield. Louis opens his mouth in surprise as he looks at the burning tavern and asks who could have done this. The buildings around them are already in burning ruins, and there are dead bodies lying on the ground. Louis turns around when he hears an elderly man from the tavern lying on the floor, asking why he's here. The man shouted at him to run, and that Tyan had betrayed them. He adds that Tyan made a deal with Bear, but then something cuts his head in half. Shrouded in shadow from above, with no clothing above his waist, Thern approaches Louis as he passes through the lights, and is surprised that Louis was able to defeat his subordinates and return unharmed, despite having drunk a poison that neutralizes ether. He adds that he underestimated him or overestimated those weaklings. Louis stands in front of Thern, who is walking towards the dead body with his axe sticking out of it, and shouts at him that he's crazy. Wide-eyed with anger, he asks why he killed his allies, and whether his purpose in killing them was not his own. Allies, Thurn asked, pulling his bloody axe out of the middle-aged man's body. He asks Louis what he's talking about and explains that he didn't kill any of his subordinates today, which makes Louis' eyes widen even more. Putting his hand on his belt and slinging the axe over his shoulder, Tyan added with a disgusted look on his face that he had simply gotten rid of the hindrance by moving towards his goal. Louis gritted his teeth in anger and shouted what he was talking about since they were fighting side by side. Thurn calmly closed his eyes and agreed to reveal all his cards because Louis was left alone and said that he had made a deal with Viscount Bear. Showing his clenched teeth threateningly, Thern said that Bear had promised to grant him a title if he abandoned his mercenary army and began to say, but if I let you go. Gritting his teeth in anger, Louis finished his sentence by saying that they were destined to meet in the next territorial battle and concluded that Tyan had decided to kill them. Thern smirked, glanced at the burning buildings, and told Louis that he was quick to learn, and then added that because Louis was on the street, he couldn't trust anyone, so he thought Louis would do something stupid. Thurn grinned unpleasantly at Louis. Louis said calmly, is that all? Louis violently leapt at Tyan and slashed down with his sword, but Tyan blocked the blow with his axe. Louis gritted his teeth in anger, glaring at Turn's face as he grinned maliciously back at him. They swung at each other again, Louis' sword slash leaving a blue trail and Thurn as a green one. Louis' eyes glow red as he swings his sword. Tyan blocked the blow with his axe again and backed away from the force of the blow, dropping to one knee and laughing. He smiled and said that he wanted to give Louis a painless ending, but apparently it wouldn't work. Swinging his axe, which was wrapped in green energy, he shouted to Louis that he should not forget that Tyan was one of the heroes who made a name for himself during the Holy War 50 years ago, and based on his experience and skills, he was on a completely different level compared to Louis. Tyan smiles wickedly, his eyes glowing green, and his face is lit up by the green energy coming from his weapon. Thern swings his axe, which is wrapped in green energy, and the ground beneath him begins to crumble, sending shards of it flying into the air. He tells Louis to watch carefully, revealing that it is his ability that has helped him earn the nickname Lumberjack. He explained that it is capable of demolishing absolutely everything within a radius of 20 meters around, like trees. He was about to say her name, but Louis cut his body in half with his sword glowing with blue ether energy. Shocked and wrapped in blue energy, Thern coughed up the blood that spurted from his mouth. Louis turns around to glare at him, surrounded by blue energy, and his eyes glow red. 
Thern is surprised that Louis is still using ether and then adds that this is to be expected, and he was right about its potential when he first saw Louis. Tyen falls to the ground, blood spurting all around him, behind Louis, who is holding a sword wrapped in blue energy and not looking in the direction of the fallen Tyen. Louis is standing in front of the burning building where they had just nonchalantly eaten and drunk with the entire mercenary squad. The ground in front of him was littered with bloodied bodies. Louis thinks about how he spent two years with Tyen's mercenary team, and exactly the same amount of time he spent in the hospital waiting to die. Louis picks up the sword lying on the ground. He purses his lips and stares blankly into space, lost in thought. He reflects that in his previous life, he just waited for death for two whole years alone. But after two years in this world, he is the only one left alive, collecting swords from the ground, walking among the lifeless bodies. Louis thrusts his sword down and thinks that nothing lasts forever and that he knew that one day he would leave this group of mercenaries. A sword blade protrudes from a pile of rocks, and Louis plunges another sword into the ground as he goes. In front of the burning swords lies a pile of stones with a sword stuck in its top, and swords are stuck in the ground with their hilts up, resembling graves. Louis leaves the place with a serious face, thinking that this moment has arrived sooner than he expected. A human figure is depicted against the background of the number 80 and a DNA chain. Currently, the average life expectancy is 80 years if all the conditions are met. Three minutes is the time that a person can live without air. Three days is the time that a person can spend without water. Three weeks is the time you can live without food. And last of all, a counter that only exists for Louis, the time he can live without killing people. Louis hand is on the hilt of his sword, lying on the ground next to a bloodied man in light armor. The blue counter shows 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 52 seconds. Louis reflects that to live another day, he must kill, and all that is needed for such a life is eternal war. A bald man in a white shirt and black vest adjusts his round glasses and with a strained face retorts that what he needs to live is money, and informs Louis that he has a debt of 8,600 gold. In response, Louis stiffens in surprise and grits his teeth in exasperation. He loudly puts his hands on the table where the bald man is sitting and shouts that he has never borrowed money in his life, and no one has ever lent it to him. The bald man asks with a smile if he is sure that he has never borrowed money. He recalls that the building that their mercenary group rented burned down last night. Louis replies that he understands what he's talking about, but asks why he has to pay for it. The man points a finger at a piece of paper and asks Louis to take a look. A man with a serious face points at the paper and says that those who join the mercenary sign a joint warranty liability agreement, which means that Louis is the one who is responsible for damages. Louis leans closer to the man's face and shouts that he's trying to cheat on him, and he never signed that. The man smiles back and asks if he can see the signature on the paper in his hand. Louis looks down at the paper and opens his mouth in shock. Louis flashback. Thern is sitting at a desk with a small stack of papers in his hand, and with a smile beckons Louis to sign them, who turns around with a beer in his hand. Louis walks over to the desk and leans over the paper, signing it with one hand and holding a beer in the other, and asks what it is. Tyen replies, putting his hands on his belt, that this is a request to join the mercenaries. Gritting his teeth in anger, Louis tells the bald man that he didn't know it was in the contract, to which he responds by adjusting his glasses and looking at the contract, that he should have read it more carefully before signing it. Louis swears and shouts that it's a scam and he doesn't have any money, and asks what they're going to do if he doesn't pay, and the bespectacled man's face darkens sharply. Two blades immediately touch Louis' neck, which catches him off guard. Behind Louis is a crowd of men with swords, and the bespectacled man says that Louis asked him what would happen if he didn't pay the debt. He explains that Louis will lose his mercenary status first, and he won't be able to get that status in their country or anywhere else. Iron plate with a red cross. The man goes on and says that secondly, there will be a bounty on his head and mercenaries from all over the world will hunt you down. A crowd of aggressive men stands ready to attack. The bald man smiled and locked his hands in front of his face, saying that he wasn't sure if Louis knew, but wizards paid a pretty penny for night organs that could use ether. He added that the decision was up to him, and he was giving him a minute to think. Louis stands silently, surrounded by swords, his face serious. Louis glared at the crowd of armed men behind him and said that a minute would be enough for him. He said that if he decided to fight them, he would bet that he would kill at least half of them. Then I told him to stop showing his strength and put his sword away before he killed everyone here. The men made nervous faces. Louis was already reaching for his sword when the bald man asked him to calm down and explain that he was just explaining what could happen in the worst case scenario. He suggested that Louis solve the problem in a more mercenary-like fashion. The men backed away from Louis. The bald man explained, earn money by fighting for your life. He said that they had received a request from Viscount Bear this morning, and he had promised a huge reward, and it was about dealing with the illegal armed forces in the Black Forest belonging to the Viscount. Thin figure of a man in an expensive outfit. Adjusting his glasses, the bald man said that he had sent two squads, but they were all defeated. 
Louis stares at the paper with his hand on his chin and his teeth clenched in tension, and thinks about how not so long ago Bayer was his enemy and now he's going to be his employer. Taking his hand away from his face and closing his lips, Louis thought that since it was said about the armed forces, it meant fighting the group, and noted that the amount of reward was exorbitant. He noticed that given the recent losses in the territorial war and the compensation paid, the Viscount shouldn't have much money left. The bald man reached out and told Louis to return the ad if he couldn't complete it. In response, he gritted his teeth, gripping the paper tightly in his hand, and said that he just needed a second to think, and headed for the exit. Louis slammed the door on the other side as the bald man shouted after him that Louis should come and report to him every three days, and if he didn't, they would report him dead and there would be a reward for him. As the bald man was lost in thought, he thought about how he was able to solve this problem. He noted that he felt as if he had forgotten something. Then, he remembered that the Black Forest was a place where demonic beasts appeared. In the forest under the night sky, a huge wolf-headed monster opened its toothy mouth and blood gushed out from the slashed wounds it had just inflicted. The blue counter reads 588 hours, 13 minutes, and 42 seconds. Louis is standing with his sword raised behind him with a trail of split air from the swing he just made, and in the air behind him you can see the silhouette of a monster split in half. Louis swore at the bald man and said he should have warned him about this. Putting his foot on the corpse of one of the defeated monsters, Louis says that he knew that there were monsters in this fantasy world, but this is the first time he sees them with his own eyes. After asking if they increase his time because they are considered living beings, Louis opens the system. The blue timer shows 701 hours, 50 minutes, and 47 seconds. He notices that each of them gives him 60 hours, which is more than people do. Louis thinks about how he still remembers his first murder. Louis has a horrified look on his face as he stands with his sword wrapped in blue energy, having just landed a blow that caused blood to gush out of someone's body. Louis notes that it still sticks in his mind as if it happened yesterday. Louis stares in horror at the blood spatter. He notes that the human figure is absurdly easily cut by ether. He thinks about how he's no longer Min Hayek, a South Korean citizen, but Louis, who lives in a fantasy world. A guy in simple work clothes stands in horror, tears come out of his eyes, snot comes out of his nose, and from below you can see splashes of blood and the blue glow of ether. Louis thinks about how he has come to realize that in order to live, he has to constantly kill living things. Louis tries to hold back the vomit coming out of his mouth with his hand. He thinks about the constant thoughts about how hard and scary it is, the thoughts that he has to keep doing it. Covered in someone else's blood, Louis is on all fours on the ground, surrounded by corpses and silhouettes of people with guns. He thinks about the thoughts that he has become like them. Louis looks at the two men, one of whom is counting the money he collected from the dead body and the other is holding a sword stuck in the same body. Louis reflects on the fear that he, too, has begun to think of human life as a resource and notes that life nevertheless gives him an exciting sense of relief. Louis looks away wearily, blood splattered on his face and the remains of vomit that has just erupted on his chins. He notes that it is not surprising that this feeling does not last more than two weeks because for a person with such a fate, feeling guilty would not help at all. Louis brandishes a bloody sword with a determined face, Dead bodies lie on the ground, and behind him people fall to the ground, cut in two. Louis is standing in the same position, but instead of people, he is surrounded by defeated monsters. He thinks that right now, while he's fighting the demons, he's remembered something he'd almost forgotten about. Louis stares at the blood spatter with a sad face and a blank stare. He says he didn't want to live like this, but it happens because he doesn't want to die. Standing sword in hand, surrounded by fallen monsters lying on the ground, he wonders if demonic creatures are always like this, and notes that they give him a lot of time, and there are a lot of them in this world. Louis adds with a blank look that maybe he can live without killing people. He wonders out loud if he should just become a monster hunter once he's done with the job. A broad man with a short beard tells Louis that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He stands with his red and white hair pulled back in a ponytail and looks down at Louis from the cliff. The man tells Louis that he barely made it to the entrance of the forest and asks if he thinks anyone can become a monster hunter. Louis says with a serious face that he won't know until he tries, and asks the man who he is. He replies with a grin that he is a monster hunter who lives in this forest. A crowd of demonic monsters stands with bloody mouths over the bodies of dead people. Fifty years ago, they appeared all over the continent, and no one knew where they came from. There are many different types of demonic creatures, but most of them exhibit aggressive behavior towards humans. The face of a demonic monster with huge bloody teeth, a double tongue, and a lower jaw that splits in two. Among demonic monsters, high-ranked monsters are comparable to knights or may even surpass them in strength. A knight in armor stands with a sword glowing with red energy, taking a fighting stance in front of a huge demonic beast with its mouth wide open. Some of the demonic monsters have special abilities. The monster hunter said with a grin that those who hunt them are called monster hunters. As he jumped down from the cliff to the same level as Louis, 
he told him that there were several rules among them and the first of them was not to hunt in someone else's territory. He pointed his finger at the corpses of the demonic monsters lying on the ground. The monster hunter added that it didn't matter how low level the demon was. Crossing his arms, he says that today he is generous and will forgive Louis, and starts to say what would have happened if another hunter had taken his place. But Louis interrupts him and says that he can take the animals by putting his foot on one of the corpses, which surprises the hunter. Louis says that he is definitely interested in hunting demonic creatures, but he doesn't need prey and adds that he also has questions. He asks the hunter if he knows anything about the illegal armed forces in this forest. The hunter replies that it's about them, monster hunters, and adds that the Viscount continues to call them that. Louis put a hand to his face thoughtfully and said that he should take it back. Perplexed, the hunter asked me to tell him so that he would understand. Louis slammed his sword down on top of the hunter and told him that he didn't have any other feelings and that he was only doing it because he had to. His face is serious and his eyes are glowing red. The hunter caught the blade in his hand and with a grin told Louis that he looked like a hunter, but all alone, and asked if he had heard of other groups that had tried and failed, adding that he needed to gain strength. Louis gritted his teeth and noticed that the hunter was holding onto his sword despite the ether. The hunter smiled ominously at Louis, still holding the blade in his hand, and said with a chuckle that he liked his spirit, but there were plenty of talents like Louis during the Holy War. Louis' face lit up with the blue energy of the ether, and he noticed that the Holy War was mentioned again, and he thought that even if he didn't know what it was like, there was nothing that a human couldn't handle. He swung his sword at the hunter, causing a bright flash of blue energy to illuminate the battlefield, and was behind him, but he noticed that his sword, glowing with blue ether energy, had split into pieces, which caused him to be puzzled. Louis turned around and saw the hunter punch him in the torso, which also creates a blue flash, and Louis flies a good distance from the force of the blow until his back hits a large rock, which shatters into pieces from the force with which it flew into him. Blood spurted from Louis' mouth. The hunter immediately rushed over with a big smile on his face to give him another punch. With a quick movement, Louis unsheathed his dagger. The hunter punched Louis' torso, causing the rock behind him to shatter completely, but Louis managed to catch the hunter's hand before it reached his body. The hunter's hand was shrouded in blue energy. The hunter smiles as he looks at Louis' dagger, which he just dodged, and remarks that Louis will show off his spirit to the end, and adds that he's starting to like it. Louis, exhausted, fell to the ground with a dagger in his hand, and the hunter said that he didn't want to go that far, and that he was too excited. Around them lay shards of stone and fallen trees, roughly broken across the trunk. The hunter scratched the back of his head with a puzzled face and asked what he should do, because if he left Louis here, he would be devoured by demonic beasts. Then he looked down at the hand that was scratching the back of his head and was surprised to see blood on it. He noticed that he had received this wound while fighting him and smiled. Louis is lying on the ground, unconscious, and a small gash between the hunter's fingers is drawing a small stream of blood. Chuckling, the hunter said that he thought he had found a rather entertaining boy. Louis thinks about how he hates this world where he has to kill to survive. Louis walks across the ground littered with people's bodies, thrusting his sword into them. He thought about how after the territorial war ended, he had wandered around this place looking for the living to extend his life a little, and added that he didn't want to kill innocent people if possible. Louis turned around at the voice that said with a sneer that he wasn't so funny when he was lying. He saw a smiling Thern lying on the ground, cut in half. Thern asked him if the fallen soldier wasn't already a living person, even if half dead. With a crazy smile, Thern told Louis that he was just lying to himself and telling him to look at himself. He asks if this is the face of the person who hates it all. Louis looks at him with a crazy smile. Louis wakes up in horror. Five men look at him, waiting for him to wake up, and notice that he is awake, including the red and white-haired hunter. Louis abruptly got up from the bed and shouted in disbelief, asking where he was. The hunter picked at his ear with his little finger and told him not to shout and that he was too loud. Louis suddenly clutched his chest, gritting his teeth in pain, and the hunter told him that his wound had opened. Shaking with pain, Louis remembered that the hunter had hit him and knocked him unconscious. A man with shaved temples and red hair with a pretentious face asked the hunter how badly he had beaten him, referring to him as the boss, in response to which the hunter awkwardly grinned and looked away. Louis noticed aloud how everyone was addressing him, and the hunter asked if he had ever mentioned this to him before. He introduced himself as Guilford and said he was responsible for all the monster hunters here. A small town with small wooden houses with thatched roofs and wooden fences stands in the middle of a forest. Guilford greeted him on behalf of Monster Hunter City and told him that it had been three days since Louis arrived. He added that he could not have imagined that he would be disconnected for so long. Louis paid attention to the words about three days and remembered that he had to come to the bald man and report back every three days, otherwise they would report his death and there would be a reward for him. Louis realized with a horrified expression that he was in trouble. 
With a nervous expression, Louis introduced himself as Louis de Lossi and said that he was a mercenary. Guilford noticed that Louis had used the past tense when talking about his experience in the mercenary business. The man with the shaved temples and the earring in his ear was surprised that Louis was a mercenary, and Guilford said with a smile that he had forgotten to tell them that Louis didn't even know about them until he tried to complete the task alone. The men stared at him with surprised expressions. The two men then burst out laughing loudly, making fun of Louis plucking up his courage, which made Louis grit his teeth in annoyance. The blue timer shows 617 hours, 48 minutes, and 12 seconds. Louis pursed his lips and thought that if he focused on killing the weakest and recharged enough to get the power of the god of war, he might be able to kill Guilford, but he didn't know how to do that, or if the quest period could be extended. He thought that if he tried to take revenge, he would be branded a traitor by the mercenary guild and forced to leave, which made his mouth drop open. Looking at him, Guilford noticed that he had some problems in his life. He asked him again about what he said about wanting to become a monster hunter when he was done with his job, and asked if he wanted to become like them. Louis reminded him with a bitter grin that it had only been a few days since Guilford beat him up and knocked him out, and clarified that he now wanted him to join them. He asked what this sudden act of kindness was. Guilford grinned and made a money gesture with his hand and asked who was going to let Louis live for free, and explained that to be here, he had to pay back somehow, and suggested that he hunt demonic creatures. Guilford explained that the demand for demonic monsters is high, and their meat can be used to prepare various dishes, and other parts can be useful as decorations or materials for magical research. Louis noticed that the demonic beasts also gave him a lot of life force, and concluded that it was like killing two birds with one stone. Guilford noticed that he was interested and suggested that we take an entrance test for him. He said that there were stone ape demons living in the west of the forest. Guilford showed him a paper with a rough drawing of the head of a stone ape demon. Guilford explained that even though Louis lost to him during the battle, he must be able to defeat at least one of them. Louis glanced at the paper with the drawing on it and thought that it should be easy. Guilford warned them not to damage their skin because it is used to make different things. Grinning and holding up his hand, Louis said it would be a great morning workout and said he would go and catch one. Louis stands in the woods with a piece of paper in his hand and looks up nervously, asking why they didn't tell him that they are four meters tall and live in groups. In front of Louis is a crowd of huge stone monkey demons, half covered in purple tumors. One of them opened its toothy mouth with a green tongue and made a loud sound, showing aggression. Looking at the paper, Louis asked who drew it. A heavy thud is heard in the forest, lighting up the forest with blue energy. Louis slides backward on the ground, leaving furrows under his feet, holding a sword that glows with blue ether energy. Louis asked if that was what they meant when they said difficulty, and pointed out that they can regenerate. The demonic beast's wound, which has something purple in it, is closing up, enveloped in blue energy. The stone ape demon in front of Louis screams loudly at him as its wounds quickly heal. Louis wonders if it's a monkey or a gorilla, then adds that he doesn't care. The monster swings its huge fist at Louis, accompanying the blow with a loud scream. Blue energy approaches the rock gorilla demon's head, exploding in a bright blue flash where its neck should have been, and its head flies off into the air, breaking away from its neck. Louis cuts off the demonic monster's head with a sword strike that glows with blue energy and ends up behind the defeated monster. He says that in games like this, to catch such a monster with an unusual ability, you need to get rid of it for a hit and then deal with others in the same way. Louis lands on the ground with one hand on the ground, and the head of the defeated stone monkey demon falls to the ground in front of him. Looking at the monsters standing menacingly in front of him, he notices that they are more submissive than he thought. Louis grins and says that at this rate, it will be very easy to earn money and increase your life expectancy. Louis is standing in town with a shocked face when he is told that this is why he can't make any money. He replies that he caught them as requested and asks what the problem is. The men stand around the three bloodied and headless stone ape demon corpses lying on the ground and complain about the mess. Guilford, with an exasperated face, taps his head with the palm of his hand and tells Louis to think about it. He asks him how he is going to sell their skins if they are all marked, adding that no one will buy such skins. Guilford twirls an irritated finger at his temple, explaining that stone monkeys lose their ability to regenerate when their heads are cut off, so if their body is damaged, you need to wait for it to recover, then aim for the face and knock out the monkey. Louis tilted his head down slightly with his eyes closed and noted with a grin that this wasn't just about hunting, but about the hunter's approach and mindset, and thought about how he needed some time to get used to it. Guilford announced that starting tomorrow, Louis would be learning how to hunt monsters from David, and if he wasn't good, he would be thrown out. Two weeks later, the severed parts of the stone ape demon fall to the ground, splashing green blood on the ground. Louis, covered in green blood, looks at the monkey pieces on the ground with a satisfied smile. Guilford's eyes widen as he notices that Louis has caught two of them, expressing admiration. Louis thinks about how slowly but surely he's adapted to this place. Louis plunges a knife into a part of the stone monkey demon's body. A bald man with a beard and a chef's hat notices that Louis is good at butchering. 
Louis is carving up a piece of the stone monkey demon with quick movements, his face expressionless. The man with the shaved temples asks if he's ever done this before. The man hands Louis, who is standing there with a serious face, a bowl of dirty orange liquid with two eyeballs floating in it, and says it's a monster stew that Louis caught. Louis stares intently at the bowl and pours the contents into his mouth, while the man in the chef's hat looks at him with a silly expression, warning him not to be too surprised. Louis turns away with a disgusted face, thinking that he's going to throw up. It means that there are still things that you can't get used to. A man in a hat solemnly raises a bowl of stew over his head, concluding that it is delicious, and announces that stew will be on today's menu. The men lie senseless with their heads on the table with grimaces of horror next to bowls of stew on the table. Louis notes that despite this, he is adjusting to what happens every day. The man in the hat screams about how this could have happened, clutching his head as he looks at the man at the table who fell victim to his stew. Louis notices with a smile that he's not checking the timer anymore. Guilford and the man with the shaved temples look at Louis' dialogue with the man in the hat. Guilford asks the man with the shaved temples what he thinks. He replies that he thinks Louis is fine, but still doesn't talk about his past. They reminisce about the first time he came and how Louis didn't eat anything they offered him, noting that Fennel's food is comparable to poison. They notice that he just thought he couldn't trust them. Louis turns away from Fennel, shaking his head and refusing to eat. Fennel stands with a confused face. Guilford, plate in hand, asks Louis if he thinks it's poison. He then asks him who hurt him and what made him so suspicious, continuing to eat casually. He adds that Louis should take a look and see that he eats without problems, and urges him not to worry. They then note that even when everyone was asleep, Louis was watching them. Louis is sitting on the floor of the house where everyone is sleeping, leaning back against the wall, sword in hand. They note that he slept with his sword in his hands. A man with shaved temples lies with his eyes open, thinking that this is unnerving. They say that with the exception of these oddities, he behaved normally, and suggested that he simply had trust issues and was not a spy. Louis is sitting with his sword, his eyes slightly open. The man with the shaved temples turns to Guilford and says that something strange is happening and they are losing contact with the rest of the posts in the forest. Guilford replies with a smile that he thinks someone needs to check them out. Then he turns to Louis, who is standing with a plate under the window, and says that instead of hunting, he should go to Jones' base today. Louis is surprised to learn that there is another animal hunter settlement besides this place. Guilford answers in the affirmative and asks if he thinks they can patrol this entire forest by themselves. He adds that if he goes straight east, there will be a base there, and tells him to check if the people there are okay. Louis walks through the woods under an orange evening sky. He thinks that this is the first day since he came to this world that he feels calm. Louis smiled a little and thought about how he didn't have any more nightmares and didn't have anything to worry about. He notes that he so wished for this peace to last forever, but this world is not like that. Louis notices that his foot has collided with a bloody corpse. He notices the corpses and notes that judging by their clothing, they are monster hunters. Examining the wounds on one of the corpses, he notes that these are knife marks, which means that this is not a monster attack, and this was done by a person who knows swordsmanship. Louis sees movement behind him and turns around. He sees a frightened woman with blonde hair without one shoe and asks her who she is. She falls to the ground in fear, seeing Louis with a drawn sword in front of her. Along the way, he notices that she is from Joan's base and says that she is on her way there. The girl looked down at the sword, clutched her head, and screamed, begging them to stop and asking what they had done wrong. She said that it wasn't enough to bother them, and knights and mercenaries were brought to them. Louis gritted his teeth in surprise. The girl asked why they were doing this, thinking that Louis had come to kill them. People approach them, expressing pleasure about what they found, where the girl went. The three men are standing with bloodied swords and smiling unpleasantly. One of them notes that her little feet must be tired from running. A man with an ear piercing asks who the guy next to her is. Then the smile fades from their faces, and the man with the piercings notices that Louis' face looks familiar. The guy in the hood asks if this is the guy with the bounty. They say it's the soul collector, Louis, and point out that he's quite famous for digging up dead bodies after battles. The girl stares at them in horror behind Louis, who stares back at them with an unwavering expression. One of the men said that he heard that after killing the members of his mercenary group, he stole money from the guild and ran away. The girl reacted in horror. One of the men was glad to have met him here. Louis asked if they were done talking. Louis looked at them grimly, his eyes glowing red. The man with the piercing said he wanted to ask you something. He held the sword to Louis' throat and asked him what he wanted to write in his will. The guy behind him yelled with his tongue hanging out to tell him to kill them. The hooded man smiled broadly and pointed out, holding his sword out, that this was a very lucky day, because they were lucky enough to take up the sweep request and find the fugitive. The man with the piercings turned around in annoyance when Louis asked about how they never bullied anyone. Louis cut off the two of them arms that were holding their weapons with quick and light sword movements, 
and told them that if they were going to threaten someone, they should first assess the opponent's abilities. The two men fell to the ground, clutching their severed hands as Louis brushed the blood off his sword. The third of them grabbed the girl hostage and yelled at Louis not to move. He shouted that he would cut the girl's neck if he came any closer. Louis threw the sword at the boy, and the hilt hit him in the face, sending him flying backwards, letting go of the girl. Louis repeated with a serious face that the threats were ridiculous. He told him to run away if he wanted to live. The men with their hands cut off screamed and ran as fast as they could past Louis. The girl grabbed Louis' arm, to his surprise, and clarified that he wasn't on the side of these people. With tears in her eyes, she pleaded with him to help them, and said that these Abur army mercenaries had attacked their city. Louis and the girl are standing at the entrance to the city, where the ground is littered with corpses. The girl is horrified to realize that they are too late. She falls to her knees and talks about how they were all good people. Louis doesn't say anything. Suddenly, his face contorts in horror. He notices severed bodies, traces of strong ether, and the fact that the entire area is completely destroyed. Louis grits his teeth and remembers Thern. Swinging his axe, wrapped in the green energy of the ether, Thern shouts to Louis that he must not forget that he is one of the heroes who made a name for himself during the Holy War, which was 50 years ago, and that based on experience and skills, he is on a completely different level compared to Louis. Thern is grinning ominously and his eyes are glowing green. Tyen tells Louis to watch carefully, swinging his green lit axe, and explains that this is the ability that earned him the nickname Lumberjack. He explains that it is able to demolish absolutely everything within a radius of 20 meters around, like trees. Louis realizes that this is Typhoon Thern's ability. On the ground, there are traces of a circular swing and chopped trees on top of the bloodied bodies. Viscount Bear's Eastern Lands, Black Forest, Hunting Post. There are screams in the city. The ground is littered with broken trees and bloodied bodies. A man crawls on the ground, panting and leaving a trail of blood in his wake. The man with the bloody axe says that crawling like a worm is very suitable for him. The man on the ground raises his head and asks him if he thinks he can get away with it. He starts to talk about what will happen if Guilford finds out, but his head is cut in two. The armored man with the axe says he doesn't care and doesn't want to hear it. He explains that they simply kill anyone who goes against Viscount Bear. The man in armor addresses the man with the axe as Captain Marco and says they have a report from scouts in the west. He says they said there was a city inside the forest, and they had a battle with someone called the Soul Collector. Captain Marco turns around at the mention of the Soul Collector, and notes that Louis is here. Captain Marco stands with an axe at the ready and says it's even better this way. He says he needs to see Louis at least once. Guilford clarifies that Bayer sent another army to get rid of them. Louis is standing in front of Guilford, who is sitting at the table, and behind him is a man with shaved temples and phenyl. Louis says that he thinks the number of opponents is different this time, and that the Viscount has recently hired a lot of mercenaries to fight. He adds that they have already lost, but since the battle is over, they use whatever they have left for a final attack. Guilford sat up, leaning his hands on the table, and said that they had been attacked many times before by large armies, but none of them had been large enough to capture the base. Guilford picked at his ear with a smile and said that he wanted to capture everyone alive and teach Viscount Bear a lesson. Louis clarifies that they won't kill them as long as Guilford blows on his little finger. He asks why a monster hunter would want to kill people. He then adds that it may happen by accident, but they are not murderers. Louis agrees, but advises them to be careful because there is a really strong mercenary among them, and if he is who he thinks he is, then it will be a very difficult battle. Guilford agreed and glanced at the blonde-haired girl, asked if she was his girlfriend, which scared her, and added that they were going to split up to prepare for battle. She excitedly said that she had never fought a single battle while at Joan's post. Guilford smiled broadly and told her that the role didn't always have to be about fighting, and told her not to worry and that there was one suitable place for her. The girl opened her mouth in disbelief. Night, a crowd of armed men with Captain Marco at their head appears not far from Louis and the girl, dressed in robes and sitting in front of a bonfire. The girl trembled and asked if they were sure that a place of decoy to attract attention outside the city was the ideal role for her. Captain Marco notices that they are trying to lure them with bait, lighting a fire at the post. He notes that this is obvious and says that they will slowly get closer. One of the men came up behind Louis and asked where the others were, raising his foot to kick. To his surprise, his leg is immediately cut off. Louis stands up, sword in hand, while the man holds his leg and screams in pain as he lies on the ground. The girl hid behind the log she was sitting on in fear. Louis praised her for her work and told her to go and hide inside the base. He took off his hoodie and said he'd get it out of here. The girl ran away. An enraged man in armor shouted that Louis was all alone and ran towards him along with other soldiers, giving the command to take him. Louis said they were already trapped. Under the feet of the opponents, a huge pit opened up, into which they fell. The armored man shouted to the remaining people to watch where they were standing, because it couldn't be that there was only one pit. 
Noticing some sounds, the men turned back, where a huge log, tied on ropes, flew and pushed them into the pit. Another armored man led his men in a different direction, saying that everything was fine here and he didn't see any traps. At this point, the net under their feet gathers them in a pile and leaves them hanging in the air. Guilford looks at this next to Fennel, clutching his head and picking at his ear with his little finger, asking if soldiers are really that stupid. He added that he thought it would be harder, but they are walking right into their traps. He notices the figure of Captain Marco. He notices the two-handed axe and wonders if it's the strong knight Louis warned him about. Captain Marco curses and shouts at them to cut the ropes with knives and get out. Guilford kicked the armored man hanging from the net in the face, causing it to sway violently, and warned them not to listen to him because they would fall straight into the pit. Guilford called Louis and said that this was the man he was talking about. Captain Marco asked about Louis' presence. Louis leapt at Captain Marco from behind, swinging his sword that glows with blue ether energy. Captain Marco has time to turn and block the blow with the handle of his axe. Louis notices that he's different. Captain Marco and Louis exchange weapons blows, Louis' sword glows with blue energy and Captain Marco's axe glows with yellow energy. They cross arms and Louis notes that the way he uses the ether, the way he fights with the axe, is the same as Tyan's. The faces of Louis and Captain Marco converge with crossed weapons between them. Louis notices that Captain Marco is a little faster than Turn. Gritting his teeth, Louis asked Captain Marco that he wasn't a Tyan. Captain Marco, furious, asks how dare he say that name in front of him. Their faces get even closer, and Louis wonders if it's him or not. A huge stone ape demon appears behind Captain Marco. She catches the attention of Louis and Captain Marco, and Captain Marco asks why the demonic creature is here. Louis thinks about how the path for the soldiers who are trapped is blocked by monsters. The armored man shakes in fear, looking up. Louis continues, admiring the fact that they use not only ambushes, but also the environment. The stone ape demon slams its fist into the ground, sending the entire enemy squad flying into the air. Louis wonders in his mind if this is how monster hunters fight. Guilford shouts for everyone to stop and that they must catch them alive. He shouts that the monsters are here and tells them to fight them first with their arms crossed over their heads. Louis' face darkens with bewilderment and disappointment. The stone ape demon continues to pound the ground with its fists, scattering people who are close to the impact site. There is a cry that the beasts are attacking. Guilford shouts back to base. The two stone ape demons continue to smash everything with their huge paws, scattering people like toys as the soldiers watch, unsure of what to do. Guilford gives the order to line up and says they just have to fight back calmly, and his subordinates line up with their swords ready. A huge stone ape demon appears next to Louis and Captain Marco, who are still fighting each other, and raises its fist-shaped paw over them. Guilford notices that the monsters are coming from the other direction as well, and shouts at Louis to dodge and that it's not the time for the two of them to fight now. Louis and Captain Marco stare intently at the demonic monster, not moving away from each other. Louis and Captain Marco continue to cross weapons, blue and yellow ether energies flying apart as the demonic monster approaches them with its mouth wide open. Louis and Captain Marco react irritably to the demonic monster interfering with their duel and hit it with ether energy at the same time. A fist glowing with blue energy hits the stone ape demon's snout, which rips its head open, and it falls behind Guilford, who has thrown the punch. The demonic monster's body falls to the ground, and Guilford lands neatly on his feet. He is surprised that even the stone monkeys are here, noting that they usually don't come out of the forest. Guilford turns around tensely, hearing a shout about the walls collapsing. Near the wooden wall, there is a blow that shatters the wall into splinters. Armed men are standing around the wall, shouting that they must prevent the monsters from approaching. A wolf-headed monster lunges with its mouth open at a terrified man who has fallen to the ground and gnaws at his neck. People shout about them being wolf-shaped beasts and ask what high-ranked monsters have left behind in such a place. Some of them are caught off guard and fall to the ground, while others run and shout to run away, and that this is not something they could handle. Alarmed, Guilford asks what is happening in the middle of the forest. The demonic monster falls to the ground. Captain Marco stands with an axe at the ready, replies that they are endless, and asks what is happening. A man is lying on the ground with purple swellings on his face. Suddenly, his eyes open. Captain Marco spots a stone ape demon raising a fist above him to strike. Louis cuts off the monster's head with a blow from his sword, which is wrapped in blue ether energy. Louis lands in front of Captain Marco and tells him that they should team up, and then he will tell him something. He explains that stone monkeys continue to regenerate until you cut off their heads. He tells him to stop doing meaningless things and aim for the muzzles. Captain Marco testily replied that he would have done so even if Louis hadn't told him so. Louis announced that they were coming. Demonic monsters are rapidly closing in on Louis and Captain Marco. Louis tells Marco not to die and that he still has business with him. Then, he leapt towards the monsters, swinging his sword that glowed with blue energy. Captain Marco repeated, 
Don't die. He said he wasn't going to die, and his weapon glowed bright with yellow ether energy, and he said if anyone was going to die here, it would be Louis. Captain Marco swung his axe and threw many quick and powerful blows at the monsters, leaving a trail of yellow energy in his wake. The monster's heads fell to the ground while Captain Marco stands on the ground, emitting a lot of yellow ether energy. Marco said that Louis is right, and they don't regenerate if he cuts off his head. He added, and the stone monkeys, and you. Captain Marco saw a sword blade quickly approaching from the scattering dust. With a blow from his sword, Louis knocks the helmet off Captain Marco's head. He said with a grim face that this was the first and last warning, and if Marco attacked from behind, he would die. Captain Marco's helmet hits the ground. Under Captain Marco's helmet was a man with a shaved head and a beard without a mustache. Louis' sword hung in the air very close to Marco's face, and Marco looked sarcastically surprised that the famous soul collector was threatening him. Louis took the sword away from Marco's face, thinking that it wasn't Thern after all. Captain Marco asked me to ask Louis a question. Captain Marco asked, passing his hand over his head, if Marco's father had ever told him anything about him. Louis said, Father. Marco replied that he was the son of Thern, the man Louis had killed not so long ago. Louis remembers cutting Thern's body in half. He thought about the fact that Thern already had a son. Exhaling, he asked him if he wanted revenge. Marco rubbed a hand across his face, grinning maliciously, and said no, and said he was just grateful that he took care of such trash. He said that it was like he didn't mention his son even to the mercenary group that he treasured as a family. The ground beneath their feet begins to shake. A man in armor standing in the pit notices that the sound is coming from underground. A strong impact occurs in the pit, which threw out the people who are there. Louis and Marco turned around in surprise. Demonic monsters that resembled huge worms with toothy mouths and long tongues emerged from the ground and used them to grab people who were thrown into the air. An armored man with a beard screamed for help as the monster wrapped its tongue around him and dragged him into its mouth. Guilford punched a hole in the monster with a fist that glowed with blue energy, freeing the armored man. They landed on the ground, and the man asked why he had saved him as an enemy. Guilford irritably told him that if he had the strength to talk, let him help save his comrades. He shouted that there was nowhere else to retreat, and now there was no time to choose sides, and told everyone to save whom they could. Louis shouted at Guilford that he was crazy because they were their enemies and they wouldn't be of any use to them even if they were saved. Guilford turned around and shouted at him not to judge them by their usefulness, and they didn't need a reason to save anyone. Guilford was a little taken aback, then exhaled and thought it made sense. He thought that in his home world it was called morality, but here it was called the honor of a knight. Guilford runs towards the huge demonic monster and slams his fist into the monster's tongues, leaving a trail of blue energy in his wake and freeing the people he grabbed. Louis added that he had never seen a knight's honor truly respected in his past or in this life. Louis is lying in a hospital bed, his face covered in a life support mask, his lips parched. Louis stabs a dying man on a former battlefield with his sword. He thought that Guilford was the first true knight he had ever seen in this world. Guilford jumps with two men on his shoulders. Louis looked back when he heard Marco say that it was complete nonsense. With an unpleasant smile, Marco talks about how boss Louis doesn't know how to use people and asks why the strong should sacrifice themselves to save the weak. He tells Louis to look at them. Men with swords stand in front of the wolf-like monsters. Marco said that if they did them a favor and pulled them out, they wouldn't be able to hold out against even one or two monsters. The worm-like monster grabs people with its tongues. Marco's axe lit up with yellow energy, and he said that at such times, the strong should take care of solving the problem to reduce the losses. Louis shouted at him that if he used this skill here, all of Marco's teammates would die as well. Marco smiled ominously and said he knew. He explained that this is a decision that will save the majority. Louis swung his sword, which was glowing with blue energy, at Marco's axe, which was glowing yellow. Louis swore at Marco and asked if he didn't care if his comrades died or not. Marco, with a grim smile, asked Louis what he was talking about and said that he had never tried to kill his fellow soldiers. He explained that they are just tools and should be suitable for at least this. Marco grinned viciously. He told Louis not to worry because it would cost them their lives. He asked him why he suddenly became empathetic after slaughtering people like grass on the battlefield and killing even his comrades. Marco summed it up, you, the master of killing people. Louis replied with a grim face that Marco was right, and unlike Guildford, he wouldn't save those who came here to kill him. Guilford tries to get the man out of the monster's bonds. Louis told Marco that as he said, he was a master at killing people, and with a swing of his sword that glowed with blue energy, he cut off his arm. Louis looked at him with a serious face, his eye glowing red, and thanked Marco for making him understand what he had to do. He said it was his job to kill bad people like Marco. 